Topic 6b, Finite Difference Approximations. In this lecture, I first want to introduce what finite difference approximations are. I then want to try to frame the problem in a way that makes it intuitive for you to generalize the concept and understand where it can go. We are not going to take this in every single direction that it can go, but we will do a lot of things. The most important aspect of this lecture is that you're able to derive a finite difference approximation and understand what's happening. Understand where that approximation is evaluating the derivative, what information it's using to calculate the derivative, and some of the drawbacks. While there's lots of methods for deriving finite difference approximations, I'm only going to cover the polynomial technique here because it's very simple. It builds on what we've done in a previous lecture where we talked about fitting polynomials to, to data. And we'll do that and we'll use that to derive our finite difference approximations. And so I'll describe the method, give you some examples, and then talk about how we can do this in MATLAB in order to derive much higher order accurate finite differences where there's a lot of terms and maybe we don't want to derive that by hand. And it's pretty simple and we'll go through some examples of that. First topic, what are finite differences? When we're talking about the finite difference method, that really does imply that we don't have a function, a, a continuous smooth function stored in memory. We really only know the function at discrete points. And in this case, I'm showing at point one, two, and three. We don't store the function between those points. And in fact, we don't know what the function is between those points. Now we can do some interpolation to make some good guesses, but the point is we don't know what the function is at the in-between points. Now suppose we have this discrete function, but we want to know the slope at some point along this function. And in this case, Let's say we want to know the slope at point F2. How do we do that if we only know the function at discrete points? Well, in this case, we'll recognize that the derivative is slope. And we can estimate the slope at position F2 by looking at points 1 and 2 and connecting those points with a line. And we'll say that the slope of this line will approximate the slope, the true slope at F2. And the reason we do that is because our points one and three are symmetrically surrounding this point two. So what is the slope connecting points one and two? Well, the slope is rise over run. How much is our rise? It's F3 minus F1. What is our run? That's the span between X1 and X3. So it's just uh, two times delta x, where delta x is the increment just from x1 to x2. So already we have a finite difference approximation which calculates a first order derivative at position x2. Now what if we wanted to know the derivative at an intermediate point? Maybe we'd like to know the derivative or the slope at point I'll call it 1.5 just to remind us that it's somewhere in between F1 and F2. Now when I write F1.5, that does not imply we're actually storing a value of F at point 1.5. What that means is I want to know what the slope is at that intermediate point just using information from F1, F2, and F3. Well, how do we do that? Again, we'll, we'll connect F1 with F2 with a straight line and say the slope at F1.5 is really the slope of the line connecting F1 to F2. So over here is our finite difference approximation from that. Slope being rise over run, the rise being F2 minus F1, and the run just being one delta X in this case. So that's our finite difference approximation for a first order derivative, calculating the slope at point X sub 1.5. Very similar argument, what if we want to know the slope over here at point 2.5? Well, we approximate that by the slope of the line connecting F2 to F3, and we end up with our finite difference approximation, calculating the first order derivative at point X sub 
Now we might want to know the second order derivative at point x2. Well, a simple way to do this is to think of the second order derivative as the derivative of our first order derivative or the slope of the slope. So our slope of the slope is still rise over run, but our rise is the slope at x.25 minus the slope at x1.25 divided by the distance between those points or the run, that's delta x. Well, we just derived above two different finite difference approximations for these first order derivatives. We can substitute those in and turn our algebra crank and suddenly we've derived at a finite difference approximation for a second order derivative at point x2. So this is already one technique for deriving finite difference approximations. So we have two already. Now, what we've just talked about is not very generalizable. So uh, this polynomial technique that we'll teach in a little bit is a lot more powerful. Before we get into that, I want to try to generalize the concept of what a finite difference approximation is. And so in my mind, I'm picturing this random scattering of points and they don't have to be distributed uniformly or anything, just some random smattering of points. So what information is hiding behind those points? Well, each point has a position X and Y in two dimensions. In three dimensions, it would have a Z. And there's also a function value there, an f, an f1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So we have this random smattering of points. Now suppose I wanted to estimate the function or one of its derivatives at some point amongst these blue points. So this red point is where I want to evaluate my derivative. The, the blue points is the information we have from which to derive the function or one of its derivatives at the red point. Well, it turns out uh, there's a few ways to do this, but let's say we do it. Our answer always has a very similar form, whether we're interpolating the function or any of its derivatives, it's always just some weighted sum of the function values at each of those blue points. So the F values will be known. Our job is to determine what are these weights? What is A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, A6, and A7, or however many we need? Those A terms are called our finite difference coefficients. Our goal in this lecture is how do we calculate those A terms? It will turn out information from the position of the points is what goes into those A terms. That's where that information is stored. Now, if we have some random smattering of points that we're showing with these blue dots, and we wish to evaluate our function or derivative at the red dot right in the middle, and let's say we go ahead and derive our finite difference coefficients or finite difference approximation, and we get an answer. Now let's say we take that same distribution of points, but offset them. But notice it's the same distribution of points. Their relative positions, blue and the red dot, is all the same. It turns out we will derive the exact same finite difference coefficients, the exact same A terms. So we are allowed to offset or shift our coordinates and still get the same coefficients. This will be hugely useful, as you'll see. What if we have the same smattering of blue points, but we move the red point? So we're, we're evaluating our function or one of its derivatives at a different point. It turns out we get completely different finite difference coefficients. So that's a different problem. What if we evaluate our finite difference at the same point, but the points from which we're evaluating that change their position? Well, it turns out we get different coefficients. So in the end, we're only allowed to shift our coordinates and still get the same finite difference coefficients. If we do anything else, we have to rederive new finite difference coefficients. There are, well, there's many types of finite differences. There's three main types uh, commonly talked about. 
One is a central finite difference. In a central finite difference, we are evaluating the function or one of its derivatives at the midpoint between our function values. This is the most accurate way to calculate a finite difference, but it's not the only way. There's also what's called a forward finite difference. Suppose we're interested in evaluating the derivative at point F1, but for some reason, we don't have information on either side. We only have information on the forward side of it. So if our finite difference approximation contains information only forward of where we're actually evaluating, we call that a forward finite difference. Obviously, this is not ideal because we're evaluating our derivative at the edge of where our data is and maybe not getting as accurate of an estimate. We can look at this the other way around. If for some reason we're evaluating a finite difference using information on the backward side of that point, we call that a backward finite difference. And it really has the same drawbacks as the forward finite difference, not quite as accurate as the central finite difference, but there are times where we just don't have a choice and we have to use the forward or backward finite differences. Here's a neat little animation where we have three points and we are evaluating the, or we're deriving our finite difference approximation to calculate a first order derivative. And what we're changing here is the point where we're evaluating that first order derivative. And we can watch those finite difference coefficients change as a function of where we are evaluating that finite difference. So I'll let this play for a few seconds, a few moments. And feel free to fast forward or pause or rewind or look at this. I think this is a really good animation to stare at for a while. And I guess if I think about it, I'll try to make this animation available on the website. I will add that to my to-do list. So here are two things that we really need to keep in mind and keep control of when we're talking about finite differences. The first is the positioning of the points from which we are evaluating our finite difference. In this case, we're talking about the blue points. So where are those? How densely are they packed? What are their positions? The more densely they're packed, usually the more accurate we can estimate our function or one of its derivatives. But of course, that's more calculation. So there's a typical trade-off. We can improve our accuracy, but it requires more calculations, which probably requires more memory, more simulation time, etc. So the position of points from which we're evaluating our finite difference is very important. The next thing that's also extremely important, maybe more important, is knowledge of where we are evaluating our finite difference. And we could choose to evaluate our finite difference in the middle of our function values, which is best. That's more like a central finite difference. But mathematically, it's possible to be evaluating our function out here. Clearly, that probably wouldn't be the most accurate way to do it, but it is a way to do it. So when we're talking about finite differences, when we're using them, when we're deriving them, we really need to have a good knowledge of the distribution of points from which we're calculating the finite difference and where that finite difference is calculating the derivative or interpolating the function. In this section, I'm going to discuss how we can use curve fitting to polynomials, called the polynomial technique for deriving our finite difference approximations. There are other techniques, but this is very simple. It builds on what we discussed previously when we fit polynomials. And so that's what we're covering here. So here's the general concept of how we can do this. Suppose we have fit a polynomial to some set of points. So to fit this nth order polynomial, we needed n plus one points. So we had n plus one points and fit it to a polynomial. How is it we can use that to interpolate the function or one of its derivatives? Well, assuming we have number values for a naught, a one, a two, and so on, we can take our polynomial, and if we just use the polynomial, we have a way of interpolating our function amongst that distribution of points that we did our curve fit. 
Well, we can also differentiate this polynomial. We can take the first order derivative, and now we have a new polynomial that we can use to interpolate the first order derivative. We can differentiate again, and now we have a polynomial that we can use to interpolate our second order derivative, and third, and fourth, and so on. So here are the polynomials that we will use to interpolate the function or one of its derivatives. And let's look at this for a bit. What value of x would make evaluating these polynomials very, very easy? Well, I think it would be at x equals 0. If we set x equal to 0, suddenly the way we evaluate our function or any of its derivatives becomes very very simple so in fact what we'll do is we will shift our coordinates so that x equals zero is the point where we want to evaluate our function or finite difference and suddenly these polynomials reduce to this really simple form so we're using that property where we know we can shift our points from which we're evaluating our finite difference and it does not change the finite difference coefficients. We can reuse that anywhere, no matter where those points are. So it's a very useful property. Big question is, how do we make this happen every time? And we already hinted to it by shifting our coordinates. So we shift our coordinates this way. Our original coordinates we'll just write as x. If we want to evaluate our derivative, so interpolate the function or one of its derivatives at point x fd, so the fd means a finite difference, that's where we we're evaluating our finite difference. If we just subtract that from our true values of x, we'll get our shifted coordinate system, where all we did was subtract this x fd. So we can rewrite our polynomial in terms of the shifted coordinates. And that's fine to do. And so when it comes time to evaluate our finite difference, since we said we're gonna have that exist at the point where in our shifted coordinate system, the tilde x equals zero, our problem just reduces down to what we're showing at the bottom of the page. So our, we can interpolate the function just using a naught. We can interpolate the first order derivative just using a one. Our second order derivative using a2 just scaled by a factor of 2 and so on. So this really simplifies things and it's very useful and it's okay if it's not making a whole bunch of sense right now. When we work through examples you'll see how this is done. At a high level there's, this is really a four-step procedure for deriving finite difference approximations using the polynomial technique. The first step is just to define the set of points from which we want to calculate our finite difference approximation. So if we want to use three terms in our finite difference approximation, we need to th pick three points. And we'd like those three points to be as close to where we're evaluating our derivative as possible. So that's step one, just picking our points. Now what we want to do is shift our coordinate system such that in our shifted coordinate system, x tilde, so the tilde reminds us this is our shifted coordinate system, where x tilde equals zero, that's where we're evaluating our derivatives. And that makes, uh, it makes our polynomials much, much simpler because most of the terms drop. So we pick our points and then we shift them so that in the shifted coordinate system, x equals zero, where we want to evaluate our finite difference. Then, in our shifted coordinate system, we fit this smattering of points to a polynomial. Once we have our polynomial fit, we'll know values, numerical values, for a0, a1, a2, and, and so on. The last step is then to use those polynomial coefficients to write the finite difference approximations that either approximate or interpolate our function or one of its derivatives at x tilde equals zero. So that's the high level. Let's go through each of these steps in more detail and talk a little bit about how it may be implemented in MATLAB. Uh, we'll save the bulk of the MATLAB discussion for the examples. So step one, we pick our coordinates 
from which we want to approximate our derivative. And we will store those coordinates in a column vector and just call that column vector x. Step two, we want to shift our coordinates such that in the shifted system, we're evaluating our function or one of its derivatives at x equals zero. So now what we want to do is we want to correct our column vector x or essentially construct a column vector of x tildes. This is our x values in the shifted coordinate system. So in terms of the original x values, we'd write it this way. Uh, the reality is we will just store a column vector of our shifted coordinates. So for example, if we're doing a central finite difference, we would expect that these first values would be some negative values of x. It would pass through zero and go up to some positive values of x. If it's not a central finite difference, that zero could be just about anywhere else. So we shifted our coordinates. Now our goal is to big this, build this big matrix X and recall our discussion when we were talking about fitting polynomials to curves in a previous lecture, we have to build this Vandermond matrix where the first column is all ones. The second columns are our values of X, then our values of X squared and all the way up to some value N. And this is a big square matrix. Uh, in terms of our uh, original coordinates, we could write this X matrix this way. I tend not to do that since we already shifted our coordinates. I will just build this big Vandermond matrix this way. And remember, we need all ones in this first column. So even though I write this as our shifted coordinates to the zero power, we really can't do it this way because if there's zeros in this X, zero to the zero is still zero. And we want all ones here. I simply write it this way so that we can see there's a zero, a one, a two, a three, and all the way up to N. So we build our big X matrix. Once we have this X matrix, we will invert it to get our Y matrix. And with practice, you really can stop here and you'll recognize that the rows in this Y matrix are the finite difference coefficients. Uh, we need to proceed a few more steps before that becomes obvious. So we invert X to get our Y matrix. So once we have the Y matrix, we, have, we now solve our, our polynomial equation, if you will, for our polynomial coefficients. So we do a matrix division of this inverted X matrix to get the Y matrix. We multiply it by our column vector of function values, and that gives us our polynomial coefficients. I'll mention one thing here, which is, I think, quite different than when we were doing polynomial fitting. When we were doing polynomial fitting, we had numerical values for F1, F2, F3. We don't have numerical values for them yet. F might be something we're solving for. So in this framework, the F stays symbolic. So those polynomial coefficients, there will be number values for the Ys, but our polynomial coefficients will be numbers multiplying symbolic F values. So if we do the math, we can pull out our polynomial coefficients, A0, A1, A2, and we'll have numbers where the Ys are, but the Fs stay symbolic. Then the last step is we finally write our finite difference approximations. And Remember this set of equations when we differentiated our polynomial. At x tilde equals zero, this is where we're evaluating our finite difference. The approximations just reduce to essentially the polynomial coefficients. And here's a repeat of what those polynomial coefficients were from the last slide. So let's go ahead and write our finite difference approximations. So if we want to interpolate our function, that's simply just a naught, so this expression over here is how we would interpolate our function at the point x tilde equals zero. So that is essentially our finite difference equation for interpolating the function. Now the first order derivative is just a1. Well, here's our expression for a1, and that's exactly what we write here. This is our finite difference approximation for the first order derivative at the point x tilde equals zero. Now the last one, it's easy to forget this too. It's actually two times a two. 
We have this expression for A2. We just need to remember to multiply this by two, and then we will have our finite difference approximation for calculating a second order derivative at the point x tilde equals zero. So looking at this, now we can recognize that the rows of that y matrix were essentially our finite difference coefficients. One little difference and something easy to forget is this factor of two and the higher order derivatives have a different factor there. It's easy to forget that, especially considering the first order derivative, which we'll do a lot, doesn't have a factor there, or maybe we can think about it as being a factor of one. So don't forget that factor. Now let's work through a series of examples where we're deriving real finite difference approximations. We're not using MATLAB yet. How we use MATLAB to do this comes later. So these examples are essentially done on paper or PowerPoint slides in this case. Example one, suppose we have three points un distributed uniformly, and we would like to calculate or derive our finite difference approximation for first order and second order derivatives at the midpoint. How do we do that? Well, one, we can jump straight to our shifted coordinates. We have a distribution of three points. We want the x tilde equals zero to be where we're evaluating our finite difference. In this case, it's the midpoint. So the x value for the midpoint is zero. Now in place of delta x for our grid spacing, we're using h here. Uh, that's a pretty common notation in the literature. So we're using h here. So if this is three points evenly distributed, then the first point would be at minus h and the third point at positive h. So those are our coordinates in the shifted coordinate system. From that, we build our big x matrix and we essentially insert that x tilde into the columns, raising it to different powers for each column. We then invert the X matrix to get the Y matrix and reminding ourselves that the rows of this Y matrix are essentially our finite difference coefficients. So from that Y matrix, we multiply the Y matrix times our F column vector. Remember these are symbolic Fs, but we can multiply this out to get expressions for our polynomial coefficients. And we end up here. So on the in the center part of these equations, we're doing the row column multiplications, and then we simplify, and we end up with, for A0, just F2. For A1, we end up with a minus F1 plus F3 over 2H, and for the A2, an F1 minus 2F2 plus F3 over 2H squared. Then the last step is we write our finite difference approximations. Remembering that we're evaluating our finite difference at x tilde equals zero, we just pull off these polynomial coefficients for evaluating our finite differences. So what was a naught? That's just F2. Does this make sense? We're interpolating the function at the midpoint. Well, F2 is the midpoint, so that is interpolating the function. There's no interpolation needed. We actually knew the function value there. It would have been strange if the F1 or F3 popped up into there, since we're interpolating at the position of F2. All right, our first order derivative was just the A1 polynomial coefficient. So we're really just grabbing this expression. And it's F3 minus F1 over 2H. H remembers the grid spacing. This is rise over run. That is our slope. That was one of the first finite differences we derived. Okay, what about the second order finite difference? That's two times A2. Here was our expression for A2, and when we multiply this by two, the two in the denominator disappears. So this is our finite difference approximation for a second order derivative. All three of these are calculating those finite differences at the midpoint, at the point X2, or we can think of it as where x tilde equals zero. And in fact, these second two finite differences are things that we derived earlier. Let's do another one. We have the same three points. We want to evaluate the same finite differences, 
but let's evaluate them at the first point instead of the midpoint. Let's see how things change. Well, in terms of our shifted coordinates, we have to put a zero at the first point because that's where we want to evaluate our finite differences. That places the second point at h and the third point at 2h. So we jumped immediately to our shifted x coordinates. Given that, we build this x matrix by essentially placing the x tilde column vector into the different columns of x and raising it to increasing powers as we work left to right. We then invert the x matrix to get the y matrix and the rows of the y matrix are essentially our finite difference coefficients. But just to immediately not jump to that, let's calculate explicitly our, our polynomial coefficients a naught to a1. So we take our y matrix, multiply that by the column vector of our f values, which are symbolic, and we do the row column multiplications, we end up with these equations. And then we simplify and we end up with an F1 in this position. We end up with this expression for A1 and this last expression for A2. Now we will write our finite difference approximations. So at X tilde equals zero, our polynomials reduce to this, making our job very simple. So for interpolating the function at the first point, we just end up with F1. And that makes perfect sense because F1 is the function value at the first point. Okay, what about the first order derivative at the first point? Well, that's just polynomial coefficient A1. So we go ahead and we grab this expression and write it here. And this is a little bit harder to interpret. I can look at these numbers and well, that's kind of strange. And I am not smart enough to look at those numbers and say, oh, aha, this is clearly evaluating the finite difference at the first point. And I'm not expecting you to recognize that, but certainly if you've derived it, we need to have a very good understanding of the distribution of the points from which it's being evaluated and where it's being evaluated, in this case at the first point. Then we look at the second order derivative, which is just two times A2, and that ends up being the same equation we had on the previous slide. Now let's think about that. Does that bother us that we have the same expression even though we're evaluating the second order derivative at a different point? Well, in some regard, yes, it does bother me. But the reason it's the same equation because we need three points in order to calculate the second order derivative. So we have the minimum amount of information to calculate that, so the equation's the same. Now let's do something a little more aggressive, a little more fun. Let's say we want more accuracy in our finite differences. Well, the way we do that is by adding more points. So let's say now we have four discrete points and we want to evaluate our derivatives at the midpoint of four points. Well, our column vector of the X positions now doesn't have a zero in it. Notice our the two points surrounding x equals zero is minus h over two and positive h over two. So the midpoint between four points happens at a, at a halfway spot, and that's fine. So this ends up being our distribution of points, but we will be evaluating our derivatives in between the second and third points, because that's the midpoint between four points. So we have our column vector in our shifted coordinate system. And now the procedure stays the same. We populate our big X matrix by placing the little X column vector into the columns of big X and raising it to increasing powers. We then invert that to get our Y matrix. And the rows of this are essentially our finite difference coefficients. But we'll continue with the example in case that's not obvious. And we calculate our polynomial coefficients, a0, a1, a2, and a3. And we get these expressions. From those, we can evaluate our, our finite differences. And as usual, since we're evaluating our finite difference at the midpoint where x tilde equals zero, it just reduces to those simple polynomial coefficients. So we end up with this expression for evaluating or interpolating our function at the midpoint. 
The second expression is evaluating the first order derivative at the midpoint. And then this last one is evaluating the second order derivative at the midpoint. And I'll mention again, I can't look at these finite difference approximations and then tell you where the finite difference is being evaluated. And I don't expect that, that you should be able to do that. But if you derive them, you definitely need to have a good understanding of where those points are and where it's evaluating the finite difference. That's really important. Now let's talk about how we can derive our finite difference approximations using MATLAB and the polynomial technique. Now, for these small little matrices we've been using, we really don't need to use MATLAB. But the reason MATLAB is good to use is when our matrix size grows, or maybe we don't have uniform spacing on our grid and we need to evaluate a completely different finite difference approximation for every point. So there's other reasons that we want to use MATLAB. So let's go ahead and talk about that. If you recall, when we built our big X matrices, they always had this form where our first column had all ones. The second column had number values, which I'm representing with lowercase w, multiplying h. Third column had numeric values multiplying h squared and so on. They all had this same form. Well, h was a symbolic variable. So if we want to use MATLAB for deriving our finite difference coefficients, unless we have the symbolic toolbox, we have to figure out a way to do this and get those symbolic h's out of our matrix. Well, we actually can factor that out. So our original big X matrix is now the product of a W matrix and then a diagonal matrix containing our H terms. Well, this W matrix now is fully numerical. And in fact, that W matrix is our X matrix if we just set the grid spacing to one. So if we pretended H equal one and we build our X matrix, we actually would have built our W matrix. So this gives us a way to move those symbolic variables out so that MATLAB can just invert a matrix with all numbers and no symbolic variables. So that's really the trick, factor out the H terms. So we solved the matrix equation on the previous slide for our polynomial coefficients, A0, A1, and so on, and we end up here. So now we need to invert our diagonal matrix of H's, and we have to invert our W matrix, but we invert them separately. And our W matrix contains all numerical values, so that's easily inverted with MATLAB. And the diagonal matrix of H's is easily inverted because it's a diagonal matrix. We just invert the individual diagonal elements. So MATLAB doesn't have to manipulate symbolic variables. Now that we've inverted our two different matrices, our symbolic diagonal matrix containing the H's and our V matrix, we can now multiply them back together. So we're reincorporating our symbolic H's, but we're able to do this in MATLAB without manipulating symbolic variables. So we end up here, and this would have been our Y matrix from previous examples and previous slides. So once we have our Y matrix, we can do the math and we can get our polynomial coefficients. Now in terms of these V terms and some kind of H on the denominator. So in a sense, the rows of that V matrix were our finite difference coefficients. We just have to remember to divide by H or H squared or some other power of H. So once we have our polynomial coefficients, now we're really used to what to do here. We simply evaluate our function or any of its derivatives with our polynomial coefficients, a1 or a0, a1, two times a2, so on. And these were the expressions that we calculated on the previous slide. Don't forget this too. Uh, that's something I always manage to do. So the V matrix kind of takes the place of the Y matrix in that those are the finite difference coefficients we just have to remember to reincorporate that symbolic H. And then we can derive our finite difference approximations with MATLAB without the symbolic toolbox.
let's work through some examples of how this works. Since we're using MATLAB, we can get away with calculating ridiculous finite difference equations. So let's say we have seven points, and so we can calculate seven different polynomial coefficients. So we immediately jump to writing our column vector x tilde centered around the middle point, and h is still the grid spacing. So we have a column vector in our shifted coordinate system. So to build this w matrix, which is the x matrix with the symbolic h factored out, let's pretend that h equals 1. And we can build this x tilde, and I put an extra caret over here to remind us that this is where we're pretending that h equals 1 or with h factored out. And we build our x-axis that way, or x tilde axis. So it's still zeroed at the center. The points left and right of that are minus 1, positive 1, and so on. So from that, we can build the W matrix by inserting that column vector into the columns of W and, of course, increasing the power of that moving from left to right. But we have all numbers to put in here now because we factored out that symbolic H, and that is something that MATLAB can work with. So we invert the W matrix to get the V matrix. At this point, we can jump immediately to writing our finite difference approximations. So for interpolating just the function at that point x tilde equals zero, uh, here's our expression for doing that. Because our a naught coefficient is this row in V divided by one. So I'm just reading off these terms. That becomes our finite difference of coefficients divided by one. Now the first order derivative is a naught. So I'm reading these off as my finite difference coefficients and they're repeated here. I just have to remember now to divide by h. Our second order derivative, I'm reading off the third row here, which I've repeated down here. Those are the finite difference coefficients. I just have to multiply by two and remember to divide by h squared and so on. And you could derive a third order, fourth order finite difference doing it this way. So that's a rather silly finite difference. I'm not sure anybody uses a finite difference approximation that has seven terms in it, but we can do things like that with MATLAB. It makes it very easy. So I hope this lecture was useful.